Welcome back. Today I'm assembling the motor. Here's the housing, all spit shined and polished. A bearing needs to go on the bottom there. Here's the new felt I'm going to cut the sides. I'm using the front plate and the original felt to check the fit. Unfortunately, I cut it too small, so I'll just have to use the other one and improvise something for the front one. Here's the new paper gasket I made. This is the bearing plate cover thing. It has a drip spout and a lump that catches a notch in the bearing and stops it from spinning around. Getting the bearing to stay aligned to that little notch is not particularly easy. All of the screws on this vacuum cleaner, besides the countersunk ones, have a serrated locking washer. I suppose they really didn't want the bolt to come loose. There we are, one fully assembled bearing. I've got my oil can and I'm oiling from the back. Also directly oiling the face of the bearing to make sure that felt is soaked thoroughly. Now I've got to deal with my screw up. That felt I cut was far too small so I'm improvising with the front bearing, so it'll be easier to replace in the future if I ever want to. I'm just using the leftover scrap and wrapping it around the bearing. paper gasket. Double check. Triple check. All done, like brand new. Oil the bearing. Time for some wiring. I bought this 100 foot spool of cloth covered wire from Sundial Wire. This is the original motor wire. It's a seriously rotten rubber cord and rubber plug. The new wire is a rubber cord covered in black cotton with a white tracer. For many years prior I could not find this color. They had black and any color tracer you wanted except white. Despite the fact that this vacuum originally had a black rubber cord, I think this one adds some extra vintage character to it and reminds me of old toasters and irons. Now I need a rubber grommet for the cord. Done. And here's the field coil. I cleaned it thoroughly and sprayed it with two coats of clear motor varnish so it looks nice and pretty. I have to mock install the field coil to see if there's enough room for the wiring the way I want to do it. I'm going to use an ordinary hose clamp for a cord retainer. I couldn't tell how the original cord was retained, and this was my best solution given the very limited space. I then tug on the cord to make sure it won't come out. 
Now I'm really installing the field coil. I'm using a coat hanger to align the screw holes. I had previously filed down the inside of the motor housing to allow the coil to go in and out easily because I had to hammer it out, but as you can see, it didn't go in easily, probably because of the motor varnish. It also doesn't align perfectly and takes me a while to get it straight. Done. I forgot to mention, on the bottom of the field coil, there's two wires that go to uh, electrical connector clips that go onto the motor brush holders. Back to the wiring. This springy thingy is a guard for the headlight wires. As I found this motor, it had two modern crimp connectors inside. A little strange that someone would replace the connectors only and not the decayed and dangerous cord while they were in there, but for my connections I'm using ordinary twist-on wire nuts, which might not be as good, but they will make any future servicing easier. It may look like that hose clamp is touching the coil, but it actually has just enough room. Now, I'm not grounding this motor. There are many good reasons to justify grounding, but in this case, it wasn't grounded when it was made, it will never be permanently plugged in, and most modern vacuum cleaners are not grounded either, even though this does have exposed metal. In an absolute worst case scenario, something goes wrong inside the motor, and I get a little zap from touching it. I've been electrocuted countless times before, it's no big deal. If you're in doubt about your own project though, you can always ask me. That's the internal wiring finished. Time for the armature. I cleaned it thoroughly and sprayed it down in red motor varnish. I also cleaned the commutator with a Scotch-Brite pad. The original nylon thrust washer had worn a groove into this brass ring part. I was worried that I'd have to make a special washer to replace it, but this normal one seems to fit just fine. I actually hated the red color so much that I ordered a can of clear varnish for the field coil but the color has grown on me, for the armature, anyway. I give it a spin just to make sure its fan is not clipping any of the wires. Looks good to me. I want to show you the casting marks on the front plate. You can see three little circles on this side, and on the front, you can see three countersunk flathead screws. It's interesting to me that this is sort of like fossil evidence that a mold master with three flathead screws going through it actually existed 80 years ago and was used to cast this part here. Also, you can see the number 2204 and the number 1 on the front. I have no idea what those mean. Now I check for end play and to see if it's binding. The bearings, especially the front one, are worn, so there is some end play, but I can't quite tell if it's binding or not. Time for the brushes. If you look down in the brush holder, you can see the commutator turning around. That's what the brushes brush against. These are the brushes that I found in the motor, and I doubt they're original. Luckily, brushes are fairly standardized if I ever need replacements. Now I need this old plug. It may look like hard plastic, but it is actually rubber that's mostly hardened. It does still have a little elasticity to it, and is perfectly usable. A new plug would be ideal, and somewhat safer, but I was unable to find a new plug in this old-fashioned style that had a matching female equivalent. Before disassembling the vacuum, I measured the exact length of the motor wire up to the plug, and wrote it down, so I could duplicate it exactly as it should be. I used a piece of electrical tape to mark where the plug goes, and another that will remain there permanently to stop the cloth from unraveling where the wire is cut. 
I stripped the wires and installed a plug, something which wasn't quite as easy as it should have been. I still need one of those little cardboard covers for the plug, but that can wait. Now I'm ready for a test fire. This will be a little loud. The first shot startled me. I didn't expect it to be so loud on its own without the blade on. The second time worried me because my trained ear heard something binding inside the motor. So I have to open it up again. Here's the source of the binding. You see that little rough spot there? That's a drop of motor varnish that dried into a lump. You can see the rub spots on the armature. Luckily, it was nothing a simple file wouldn't fix. This curious thing is used for balancing model airplane propellers. It simply has a couple of free-spinning wheels on either end. Here's the armature and blade assembled together. I did check the balance of the armature by itself, and it was already perfect. Watch what happens as it spins. You can clearly see it's trying to fall to exactly one angle, which means it has a heavy side. If you look closely, you can tell that the lightweight side is the side that was corroded by sitting in water, and the heavy side has no corrosion and has therefore lost no metal and no weight. To balance it, I have to remove weight from the heavy side. I use an ordinary drill bit and was careful not to drill all the way through. Watch what happens now. It has no intention of falling to one angle like before, and will stop at any position at all. This balancing will make sure that the vacuum cleaner does not vibrate. Time for another test fire. This is going to be loud. Rated at 300 watts, it's right on the money. And that's it. The Heart of the Beast completely rebuilt. Ready to go. Thanks for watching.